I love you. Welcome back, Couch Potatoes. We have another riveting Batman playlist episode for you today. I am the Green Traveler from Gorsh. And I am the Faceless Lord! <laughs> this is a podcast about movies and TV, and yeah, that's the voice I would do if I were to play the Joker. So there you go, Warner Brothers. That's my audition for your next Rob Pat movie. <laughs> Somewhere out there, a producer is scratching a name off of a list. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, you guys, <laughs> I'm going to scratch this name off of every list we have. He thinks it would be a good idea uh, to do this for the Joker. And I'd never get a job. Ever, ever. No offense. No, it's okay. It's a, it's a tough job. It's a, it's, I don't even know if you want it, honestly. Everybody who seems to have it, except for Cesar Romero, has issues with it. Yeah. I mean, Cesar Romero might have had issues with it. I haven't actually read. Who knows? But, but his version was just so goofy. It was almost jovial, right. really. But then then along came Jack Nicholson and the whole game changed, baby. Yeah. It all changed from here. Then let's dive into the, the synopsis of the 1989 Batman film directed by Tim Burton. It's, it's a very fun and exciting film because before this movie... We had camp, and that was about it. It was just camp. Or kind of like noir-ish or whatever they were doing. I yeah, guess that could have been their attempt of camp. Or it was camp before they knew what to do with camp, before they realized that uh, you could be funny. Oh. I mean, the Adam West one is just 100% camp. Oh, that's all I, it is. I'm talking like, about that's... the serial. It was not... Oh yeah, the serial. Yeah. The serial was just yeah. They they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. But Adam West came along oh, and the thing became well, campy as fuck. All yeah, yeah. And that's all people wanted with live action Batman was camp. They just wanted camp. They were just like it's just comedy. Even though the even though the comic book world was getting super serious, you know, you right. had uh, the Dark Knight Returns. Frank Miller uh, uh, came in. You know, there's the um, oh no, I'm going to get shot on. Who's the guy who did the Killing Joke? Alan Moore. Alan Moore, he came in too, and it's just like, you know, they, they brought all these, like, more serious psychological aspects to Batman and storytelling, but movie producers didn't want that shit. They wanted, they wanted hardcore, campy comedy. And then, uh, I guess, uh, I should give a little backstory before we dive into the synopsis yeah, because sure. there was a, there was an Indiana University grad, uh, <laughs> maybe not grad, but alumni kid who, uh, graduated. His name was Michael Uslan. And uh-huh. for whatever reason, the dude had money, and he's just like, I'm going to buy the movie rights to Batman. And he did that. The thing was, he wanted the seriousness of Batman. He wanted this darker... The man saw his fucking parents die and became yeah. a huge vigilante. He wanted that. He wanted that on screen. He didn't want the comedy. And so it took him a very long time to you know work producers down enough to give him the green lights for a for a Batman film like almost the whole deck like almost the whole eighties was a fight. Wow. I don't know if Michael Islin was in a fight from the beginning of the eighties, but they were trying to make these serious Batman films and it was just like, no. We want we want comedy, we want campy, that's what Batman is. And it's like, no, 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 it's not. And like it took it took Michael Islin writing his own script for it and then finally pitching that script to people and they're like, oh Oh, you can? Okay, we can see this. We can see a more serious Batman film happening. And that's when he eventually... I mean, he didn't write the script for Tim Burton's. That's It's written by... Uh, let me look it up here. Uh, hmm. Sam Ham and Warren Scarin. Sam Ham. Uh, Sam Ham. <laughs> Sam <laughs> Ham and Warren Scarin. And uh, at least Warren Scarin uh, co-wrote Beetlejuice. So I think I'm what happened was I think Sam Ham... what that Michael uh, Uslan movie would be like. I, it was probably very similar to this, but then they just had Sam Hamm write a different script for it. Like, it's, 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 I don't know. I, I am curious too. It might be very, yeah. very fascinating, or it could be just absolute trash. Like, dude's not a writer. He's a producer. He's got, yeah. He, he's kind of like me, where it's like, I mean, he might be a good writer, but it's like, I feel like he's more like where I'm like, I have these great ideas. I don't want to write them though, because if I write them, I don't think they'll be that great anymore. <laughs> I want to, like, I want to pay other people to write them and then make money off of it. <laughs> 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 you know, a cheapskate. Well, it sounds Sorry, Michael, like I'm talking about I'm talking about myself there. Not well, Michael. it just sounds like you're a producer. So what I'm I don't a producer, know what you're trying to say about producers. 
<laughs> I'm the idea person. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> the sad thing is I'm the producer with no money, which means I'm nothing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but Michael, he had the money, and he got Sam... What I, what I assume happened is Sam Ham wrote it, and then um, once they got Tim Burton to... Uh, once they had hired him as the director, I'm sure he had his you know, a, a trusted screenwriter of his, like Warren Scarn, who he, again, co-writer of Beetlejuice. Uh, I assume he had him just rewrite Sam Hamm's script to more suit Tim Burton style. I don't know if that's the actual case. That's mm. just, you know, when I when I looked into it and saw that Warren was a co-writer on Beetlejuice, I was like, this is probably what happened. Gotcha. Um, but it's it was a very... Uh, very difficult choice because again, Michael Islin, he's trying to make a very serious, more more serious psychological Batman story. He's not trying to make these campy, silly Batman. But then the the directing rights get are handed to Tim Burton, who has just been made famous from Pee Wee's Big Adventure, the comedy. <laughs> and then they cast the cast as Batman, Michael Keaton, yeah. well known comedian at this time, very typecast as a comedian at this time. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people were concerned. A lot of people were like, we wanted a serious Batman film, but you have a comedian director and a comedian uh, actor as your, your your front runners here. So a lot of people were a little worried about it. There, There's a lot of haters. So Tim Burton wasn't who he was. Yet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he was, again, he was mostly like what he had written was kind of just silly, silly fun. And so people were people were hating on it. I, uh, looking into this, I was surprised by how many people were hating on it. Surprised because this is such an iconic film now, right? Uh, yeah. Specifically because it brought us the Batman animated series. Like without this film, you wouldn't have had the Batman animated right. series. And Lord knows all the beauty that that gave us. And also the the music, Danny Elfman's uh, Elfman's yeah. music is pretty great. Oh my God, so good, so good. Yeah, this film has so much. And again, as we've already mentioned, Jack Nicholson as the Joker, which uh, he's also fun. Fun fact, he's the top build actor yeah. on the film. Yeah. That... And there's a, there's a reason for that. They were they they wanted to do the Joker and they figured he was the only person who could do the Joker. So they approached him and they're just like, hey, can, will you be the Joker? And he's like, all right, but well, I got to be top build. <laughs> <laughs> that was like one of his stipulations in his contract was like, I'll do this part, but you have to pay me this much money and you have to give me the top billing. And I just think that is the fucking greatest thing ever. <laughs> so because he's a great joker. He is a great joker. But I do want to say that I saw this list uh, of people who are considered for the joker. And I just wanted to put it off, get get the, get that list out there, because I think that well, I really don't know who one of these people are, but most of them, I think, were really interesting choices. Uh, first off, Tim Curry. Like, that, that could have been, been something. But, yeah, I, I mean, I would imagine that he would do it differently than Pennywise, but similar. <laughs> that could have been something. Uh, David Bowie, that could have been interesting. That could have been interesting. That would have been fun. Yeah. Uh, I would have loved to have a couple more Bowie movies out there. That would be cool. John Lithgow also could have been pretty yeah. fucking interesting. I yeah. I mean, he was much younger then. I don't really remember uh, I, what he looked like in the 80s. Um, I yeah. guess pretty similar to what he looked like in Third Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have liked it as much. I don't know who Brad... Oh, okay. Looking at him, I do know who ba Br <laughs> Brad give me a Durif Give me a last name. <laughs> Durif. I was trying. Oh, Chucky. <laughs> Stuttering. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to say the last name. It's Chucky. That's the voice of Chucky. Yes. Yeah, it is the voice of Chucky, but also uh, I've seen him in other things. I forgot who he was. Yeah, it's hilarious though because they uh, they remade Chucky, uh, or sorry, they remade Child's Play. Uh, not too not too many years ago, they had Aubrey Plaza and Mark Hamill's the voice of Chucky in that. Uh. <laughs> so it's <laughs> kind of funny that Brad. I didn't know that he was uh, uh, for, uh up there for the Joker role. I, I do hilarious. think it would work. I mean, his look really works for it. Uh, that's another thing, though. This guy, honestly, John Lithgow too. Uh, this guy, Ray Liotta. Who did just recently pass away, if you didn't know. Yeah, very sad. Um, Great he, actor. Good yeah, fellas. Yeah. Uh, a lot, a lot of 
small side roles and in these small independent movies like after his like peak but he's like in everything that's like a b movie Mm. he's in all of them (laughs) yeah but anyhow uh he, he like i feel like brad durif ray liotta uh and even uh james wood and john lithgow all have similar looks to to Jack Nicholson. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, Jack was always yeah, their pick. They, they definitely knew what they wanted to go. Oh, okay. Okay, so they yeah. were coming up with yeah, Jack some, was... some some uh, secondaries. Gotcha. Yeah, Jack was a huge name. Like, you know, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which actually Brad Dorff was also in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Um, but, like, the, he was... Jack was such a hard grab, especially for a role like the Joker. Like, again... <laughs> They were wanting campy comedy for so long, and, like, that just wasn't, you know, you're not going to get, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was a hard sell for John, uh, or for Jack Nicholson, but that was, yeah, those were all their backup people in case he turned them down. <laughs> um, I did say uh, James Wood just in passing, but we've talked a lot about James Wood in the past. Uh, yeah, I do love James Wood. He was an idea, uh, but also... Uh, John Glover, who I'm not mm-hmm. really familiar with, was somebody Burton put up, and uh, Robin Williams tried to get the part, but uh, yeah, that would have been that, that would have been, been quite fun too. But I'm happy yeah. he didn't. Yes, I'm happy with what we ended up with. Classic, iconic uh, performance by our dear, dear person who doesn't know us, Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Another another fun one that Tim Burton optioned up was a uh, relatively unknown actor at the time, Willem Dafoe. Oh, really? He that tried to. Yeah, that was another one of his backups. Like he, I think he wanted an unknown actor. He wanted somebody who wasn't really, you know, well known. But the studio right. was like they were hell bent on Jack Nicholson. Well, but like, I'm I'm really happy they did though. Yeah. But like, uh, him and him and Michael Keaton just did an amazing job together and it's yeah. like, you wouldn't think it either because it's like <laughs> again michael keaton was another comedian comedic actor like and I, I don't know how well known he was in 89 as opposed to you know after the batman role but like i i, I remember watching a uh an acceptance speech between uh for i think it was the people's choice awards um when batman won like you know the pe- you know people's choice for best film of the year uh, him and uh, Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson both went up there to accept the award and everything. And I just remember that during Keaton's acceptance, like as he's thanking all these people, like Jack Nicholson whispers in his ear, and and Michael Keaton, not in these words, but pretty much in these words, he was just like, "Oh yeah," and I want to thank all the haters out there. You know, he's just like everybody who told me that this is gonna be a bad movie because I was gonna be Batman. He's like, nothing inspires me more than telling me no, something like that. He's like, all you have to, all, all you have to do is say no. Is pretty much all. Uh, it's somewhere, else, somewhere along those nice. lines. It's such a good quote, but it's just like that's that's just like you know that's Michael Keaton's mentality. You tell him he can't do it, he's gonna surprise you. And nice. boy, did he surprise! <laughs> yes, I, I do feel like for really, he's kind of like the most subdued Batman. Maybe Val Kilmar, but uh, yeah. he he is very quiet, which I mean works for what the work that Batman yeah. has to do. Well, I've always like. It, it's always been hard because I feel like we've never had a good, like we've never had a perfect Bruce Wayne and a perfect Batman at the same time. Right. You know, in my opinion, Be- I mean, Adam West is great as both for the campy version. Right. That's great. Christian Bale. When we get to Christian Bale, I love his Batman. His Bruce Wayne, bit of a dick. Like yeah. <laughs> he's supposed to be this like heart, like generous, heartwarming, like yeah, uh, I feel uh, like, charity giving person. I feel like Michael kind of got that. In this, yeah, Michael's Bruce is perfect. Yeah, I love Michael's Bruce Wayne, but his Batman, I I still like his Batman. I don't think it's right. perfect. I don't it's very think close. it's a hundred percent his fault. It's the suit. No, it's not. It's the it's suit. the suit. It really is. Okay. I mean, <laughs> if if we really want to give props, though, it's Kevin Conroy. Kevin Conroy is the only one who's inhabited both Bruce Wayne right. and Batman. So perfectly, because he's the voice of him during the animation series, where Batman was his best. Let's be honest. So, let's jump into the actual synopsis of this movie. Yes. So, uh, we have 
Jack Napier working for Grissom, or is it Grisham, played by uh, Jack Palance. And um, he is a big, uh, like, he's like a Don of a gang family or something. Uh, they they haven't jumped into using the actual gangs from the comic books yet. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah, no Falcones yeah, and Baronies. And- though I don't know how popular those storylines were in the 80s either. I, I don't, most of my comic book knowledge is from, like, the last 20 years, my, my, my span of life. Right. I feel, yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I don't remember, you know, how much the Falcones and Maronis were used, but I feel like in the 90s right. is probably when they started getting their boost. Right, right. Well, anyhow, he, he's kind of a fill-in for that, and uh, Jack Napier works under him, this being Jack Nicholson, which has got to be nice to be able to just have your own name. And I feel like that is kind of a stipulation <laughs> in some of uh, Nicholson's contracts. Because he gets to be called Jack a lot. Like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even even when his character's name is Johnny Torrance. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, <clears throat> he, being Jack Napier, is also sleeping with Grissom's girlfriend, wife. I don't know. She's a very young wo- woman. I believe uh, the character's name is Alicia oh, wow. Hunt, played by Jerry Hall. I think you're right. And so Grisham finds out about this and uh, sends him out on a job it, to clear out a vault at one of his businesses, Axis Chemicals, which is like another thing. Like, why didn't they use Ace Chemicals? But I don't right. know. I know. Right? <laughs> if I can interrupt there, though, yeah. to, to lead and to use the beeline to get to the other character that they meet at Axis Criminals... The uh, the film starts off with uh, two journalists who are who are on the hunt for the Batman. That's right. Uh, specifically, there's Vicky Vale, Kim Basinger, who has just come into uh, Gotham, I believe. Yeah. And then there is oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Knox, Alexander Knox. Alexander Knox, thank played you. Played by, by Robert Wool. Thank you. What is he? In? I know his face from a lot of things. Bull Durham, because he has such a familiar face, like. And honestly, th- th- this is the biggest thing I have. This is the biggest issue I have with this movie, is that it starts off and focuses heavily on Robert Wool's Alexander Knox and Vicky Vale, uh, played again by Kim Basinger. Uh-huh. Like they are the for the first fifteen minutes, there is no Batman, right? There's no Bruce Wayne, and there's you know it cuts between the journalists and and Jack Napier. It's a very bold decision for like again yeah. fifteen to twenty minutes, but uh, that's that's. That's the beeline that leads up. Is they're they're well, hunting this mysterious Batman and getting right. all these you know, clues. He's a, just a rumor at this point, like right. just someone that criminals have seen and have blown out of proportion because of their fear of of him. And uh, mm. the cops aren't buying it, or if they do, they're covering it up. And, right. You know the the newspapers don't want him to write about. Don't want Knox to write about it either. Um, but he, yeah, exactly. He, he's kind of he's kind of like humiliated by all the other right. newspaper writers. Yeah, they're all making fun of him. Even even uh, uh, an Easter egg, man. It's it's so weird knowing the future movies and I haven't talked about them yet on this podcast. But like the, a lot of Easter eggs from this film make it into the Nolan verse, including one guy's drawing that he he's like, here, Knox, I've, I've made a, a artwork for your next article. Yeah. You know, and it's like it's a picture of the batman <laughs> and it's it's in a future uh, i think it's in the dark night and it's, it's just so, hilarious yeah. like yeah because i was watching this back and then they show that he's like here i drew you this and i was just like oh i've seen that on that guy's billboard in dark night and i was like oh, i, I didn't like know that was an easter egg i f- i kind of remember jk simmons being in that scene where they point at the picture so maybe they even do it again yeah they might do it again because i don't remember jk I just remember the one guy who was just like, "How's your search going?" He's like, "It's ongoing." Yeah, and I he's got like that. three yeah. pictures of the Batman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that was funny. But yeah, they 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 somehow uh, they hint to Bruce Wayne because they go to a um, Vicky Vale and Alexander Knox. They go to a, a party at Bruce Wayne's house. They're kind of making fun of the guy because he's like super right. rich. His house is so Buys extravagant. All this weird shit. 
<laughs> That's where we also get our first uh, uh, Michael Keaton moment. Again, fifteen minutes in. I actually, I actually wrote the timestamp down. It was eighteen minutes. Eighteen wow. minutes in, and we get our first look at Bruce Wayne. And it's just like it's it's hilarious because they're just making fun of this guy. They're just like, "Wow, what a rich fuck, right?" <laughs> and he's like walking up behind them, and he's just like, "Oh, well, actually, this is an artifact from such and such place." But uh, through that conversation, Vicky, I think Vicky drops like something's going down to Axis Chemicals. I can't remember, but like that's where he ends up going as Batman to right. Axis Chemicals. I think it was actually Alfred, uh, Alfred Pennyworth, Ooh. portrayed by Michael Goff uh, in this version and i think actually uh, until the nolan verse in the live action movies I think yeah i think he's, he's the, the only, only yeah the connecting only character. Fact. yeah <clears throat> but he is not super heavily used in this but there is this very nice moment where him vicky yeah. and bruce sitting at a table and he's embarrassing bruce with old stories that was very cute yeah I, uh you know because I obviously alfred one. raised bruce and they're in you know what we've gotten in the past that is not the relationship that we have gotten yet so it was very nice to see that right but going back to the story alfred <clears throat> lets him know that something's going down and he's like okay I'll, I'll go and he's like i think you want to use the other entrance and that's the the code that the, oh, it's time for batman shit <laughs> hell yeah but yeah batman goes to axis chemicals and uh he 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 stumps jack napier's plan i don't remember what exactly their plan uh, is well there, jack what they're, napier what they're doing. It's, a, it's, it's not jack's plan uh grissom sent him there to get caught by the cops or but really lieutenant max eckhard played by william uh hootkins he is sent he's a dirty cop and he is sent there to kill Napier. Right. Yeah, I don't I don't what I meant was I don't remember what their what Jack's like because he was told to go there right. to get something. He he was told to clear the safe of like some files and stuff because it's been compromised or something like that. Right. But when he opens up the safe it's empty. So so he's like Yeah, it's oh, all just a it's all just been, a under the Red Hood rip off a bit. Yeah, a little bit. I think that's what it was inspired by, the whole scene. And it's, it's a good, it's still a good scene. I really do love it. But it's just, it's it starts to get a little goofy. There's a little bit of camp in the action, which is still fine. Like, you know, it's it's a perfect blend of, of camp and, and seriousness, I think. But yeah, that's where you get the a lot of the iconic moments. You get the uh, the Batman uh, unfolding his cape and it like yep. flaps up in the perfect wings and everything. And there's a lot of smoke and spotlights. And <laughs> Commissioner Gordon's like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Commissioner Gordon. By the way, he's not a big character. I feel like uh, he's just no. in the background. Pat Hingle plays Commissioner Gordon. I love that name. Hingle, <laughs> Pat Hingle, Hingle. That's a good name. But yeah, he he is a uh, uh, more of a background character, like you said. So is um. There's a lot of mention of the new district attorney, uh, of course, play Harvey Dent. Yes, uh, but he's played by Billy D. Williams. Yes, um, he is. You know, Lando Calrissian. And it's just he's another one though that he's just like he's not really used. He's just kind of there, right? And um, like you know, being nerds. We know that he is Two Face. Sorry to uh, give that away right. to anybody who didn't know. <gasps> Spoilers, but uh, man, what a different movie that would be if if they got Billy D. Williams instead of uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones, yeah, I might have liked it more. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in <laughs> a couple weeks from now. <laughs> I, no, I really would have loved to see a Billy D. Williams Two Face. That would have been so that would amazing, have been interesting. But he but, is just Harvey Dent in this yeah. movie, and, and they just don't use him at all. No, you know, just like all. Commissioner Gordon, he just delivers like two or three lines, and it's just like, why did you do this? this like, I feel like there had to be a lot of cut scenes. This story really is about the origins of the Joker, the relationship between Bruce and Vicky Vale, and mm -hmm. the. Um, <clears throat> Gotham accepting Batman as their Dark Knight. That's what this story right. is about. 
So why even bother casting a big name as a Harvey Dent yeah. character? Why even bother introducing a Harvey Dent character? Yeah. Like, it's just it's it's so just, not needed. Yes, it's strange. It, it felt like they were setting up a sequel. And if that right. was what they were doing, they still needed to use the character more. Yeah. So but He's at, just there. He's just an Easter egg. If you don't know, at, at the chemical place, Jack gets dropped in an acid vat comes out the joker now he also has <laughs> um some plastic surgery done and it gets stuck as a smile and yeah his nerves are fried his nerves are fried so i think that it's a good thing they got jack nicholson because i'm not sure how many people could actually pull off those prosthetics that he had to wear yeah I honestly like thinking about the that list of people we put up. I think John Lithgow would have been good in the prosthetics. Yeah, like he could have pulled off that smile look for the whole time. But yeah, I'm really happy they didn't go that route because right, <laughs> like Jack Nicholson pulls it off and makes it scary. He sure does. <laughs> so that the rest of the, so what Joker's motive is after he kills Grisham for revenge. Uh, spoilers. What his motive is, <laughs> is to be the first homicidal artist. And yeah. uh, he's good at it. I I really like this Joker. It, it might yeah. be my... I think I might like it better than Heath Ledger. I, I might. Yeah, I mean, like, Heath Ledger is, is a grounded, like, serial killer-ish, like, scary... Yeah. But yeah, Jack Nicholson's is a perfect like comic booky villain, right? But they, he also made it a little real by having an actual motive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, like when when so like the the one scene where he kills Grisham, he not only kills Grisham, he shoots him like six times. Yes, and he's like dancing while shooting him. Uh -huh. It was a very jokery like animated animated uh, Batman. Uh, Joker. Yes. It's so good. It's so disturbing. And then, like, uh, his overall plan, too, uses the laughing gas. Like, right. I mean, he uses it smile He kills. Uh, or is it smile next? It's something weird. Like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> and he kills one reporter, like, on camera. And, like, you know, she just, she does the, the iconic thing of laughing hysterically yeah. before she falls down and she just dies with a just creepy grin on her face. Yeah. Like, it's so, it's so unnerving. Like, I, I agree with you. I really do love Nicholson's Joker. I feel like a lot of people forgot about it when Heath Ledger's came along, but like, it, it together they are really up there. Like, they're yeah. super fucking good. There's a reason both of them had to see like psychiatric help right for the for this role because it just it gets under your skin it's really i mean that's why jared leto will never have to seek psychiatric role it didn't get under his skin <laughs> the man's crazy sorry jared leto <laughs> i you, you know insane. i was just thinking it and then you said it so yeah but but heath ledger uh jack nicholson they they both poured their freaking hearts into this role it seems like it's uh, jack's is just phenomenal. I, I agree with you. It's, yeah. it's very unnerving. How he delivers his lines. Oh, <laughs> there's some chilling, <laughs> chilling deliveries in there. So I do feel like we should maybe start moving on to closing statements just because of time, really. I feel like we could talk this movie for a long time. But mm -hmm. for my closing statement, I... Uh, want to say that this is probably the Joker that I identify the most with, and that's kind of weird. Ooh. That's not good. <laughs> no, it's not that great. <laughs> but it's the whole, it's the whole artist thing. You know, and, and like, I it, in, I feel like less so now, but in my past, I definitely struggled with my temper, and this Jack has impulse issues before he even becomes the Joker. Right. Uh, and so, like, I just identified with that, and also uh, because of my father, Jack Nicholson's humor was constantly in our house. So <laughs> I, I just I don't know. For that reason, I really identify with this Jack Nicholson and uh, this uh, this Joker, and I was able to just this time watching it because it's been a few years since I've watched a movie. I was just able to watch it 
through that perspective of this being a movie about the Joker. And man, right. it is such a good movie when you watch it that way. Uh, especially yeah. since it starts off with his perspective, pretty much. Yeah. And no Batman for 15 minutes. That's right. And I he's top build. <laughs> don't think I can give this movie a face and a half, though. It gets a full face. Uh, there's some things. Like like you said, it's it's a movie called Batman, and you don't get Batman for the first 20 minutes. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, a little weird. It's a little weird, but that's I think it still built up the story very well. Uh, also, this fucking suit, man. The fact that he can't move his head, it just pulls me out of it and makes me laugh every time. Like he, right. he, to right. look to his left, he has, to, he looks with his chest. That's the humor of it because he cannot move his yeah. neck. So he just swooshes back and forth. And then to look up, he, he has to run and then he stops and looks <laughs> back. Yeah. Like he has to dip like three ber- vertebrae back. To to fucking he's got to do the Matrix thing. Yes, it's fucking hilarious. Well, he was told to let the wardrobe back too. Yes, given that limitation, Michael Keaton did a a wonderful job. It's a full face movie. One hundred percent recommend. That's fair. Yeah, I I love everything about it. You know, uh, I haven't seen it in probably a decade. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I've seen this. I watched it a lot as a kid because you know my brother and I love Batman. But uh, it's. Jack Nicholson as the Joker, phenomenal. Tim Burton's directing uh, and his his vision for Gotham is my favorite. I don't think Gotham has ever looked better than here. And like he he does a good job of like there's moments where he uses like CGI where you can tell it's animation. Right. One of my favorites is um, Batman's standing on like a a platform, you know, out looking out over the city, and like he turns around and walks back in. And it's just like, it looks great, especially for the 80s. I'm sure nobody cared. But like watching it now, you can see that it's right. an animated shot. Yeah. But at the same time, I love it. It gives that whole feeling of Tim Burton. Like th- his style has never been more perfect for anything but Sweeney Todd. Like I know sure. people hate Sweeney Todd, but like his style for his, his vision for that world, his vision for Gotham, he has such a good eye Right. For for this this style this atmosphere and it for lends that, perfectly to Batman the, the gothic world but it's not just the gothic yeah. world it's gothic Burton like it's it, yeah it's his own per, uh, uh, personal taste for sure right it's very like I don't want to say steampunky because it's not steampunky there's not a lot of that but it, it's very steamy yes. there's a lot of fog <laughs> and haze everywhere a lot of pollution and, and it, it's just it's wonderful <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and again, you know, all the haters out there who didn't like the casting of uh, Tim Burton as the director or or Michael Keaton as Batman, they both uh, proved everyone wrong. You know, I think this movie is phenomenal in in all regards. It's very fun. I love the comedy, too, because, again, they didn't want to make a very comedic movie, but there is a lot of comedy that slips in. My favorite one being when Vicki Vale and Bruce Wayne have their first date. And <laughs> and you open up and you see Vicky Vale seated at her spot at the table. She's eating, and then it cuts to Bruce Wayne and he's eating. They don't show the distance or anything. You just you have these like cut back and forth. It's like, how's your meal? What was that? Oh, I just how was your meal? And then it's like then it cuts and you see they're sitting at a very long table at opposite ends. Like it's like a ten foot, twelve foot long table, and they're just set maybe even longer than that, but they're separated and it's like a huge distance between them. And it's just like, yeah, Bruce Wayne doesn't know shit yeah. about social like relationships. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's it he is the best Bruce Wayne. And like I love also when when him and when Bruce Wayne and the Joker meet for the first time when Bruce and Vicky yeah. are together and, and Bruce Wayne just goes all uh, crazy. He's like, you want to get nuts? <laughs> yes, and he grabs like a fire so poker. I love it. <laughs> it's good shit. It's so much fun. It just I, I seems still, so I give out it, of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it really is out of nowhere. And and, and like again, we Michael Goff, he's not talked about. Like We talked about him a little bit, but it, he's a great Alfred, honestly, yeah, like he does a good job. I love him telling those stories to Vicky Vale. So yeah, I mean, it's it's great fun. I, I still I enjoy it a lot. I give it three and a half stars. Yeah, it's 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 a a classic Batman film. Classic, one hundred percent. When I think Batman, Clamp. this is a, like live action movies. This is the first one I think about. Um, and yeah, and I'm pretty sure I saw its sequel first. I'm pretty sure that's the first one I watched. For some reason, my mom didn't want me to watch this one, 
I don't know why. <laughs> Probably because the Joker is creepy as fuck. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> He is. A he, lot, he could be nightmare inducing to kids. A lot more death on screen, I think, than in the next one. But we'll see. We'll see next week, right? Yeah, that's something we didn't really talk about. Was Batman's kill count is pretty freaking high in this film, is like it? unintentionally, <laughs> but it is. Like, yeah, there's a lot of accidental deaths. He definitely doesn't in like directly kill anybody. I mean, except for the Joker. Oh, Spoilers. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he literally kills that man. But I, I feel like that was not necessarily his fault. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't entirely. His his planning was uh I think his his intentions were there, but then once he performed it, it was just like, oh wait, this is what's gonna happen. Oh shit. Yeah, you know, I forgot like, about physics. Yeah, not much <laughs> yeah, it's like not much else could have happened there, Bruce. Like, uh, ooh. The the other one I loved is the the I texted you about this after we had watched the film after I'd watched the film but uh the 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 Batmobile it's very um autonomous it can you know he he can steer it from right. afar but it yeah. basically drives itself and uh, there's a moment where it puts up its shields rolls into a building full of henchmen and drops a bomb <laughs> and kills everyone oh, I in that forgot building. about that yeah I <laughs> like, forgot about that and I texted you I was just I texted you, I was like, if a uh, remote-controlled Batmobile murders hundreds, like, is that also, does that add to Batman's kill count, or is that by itself a no- its own thing? But, like, I-, I think it adds to Batman's kill count, because I'm pretty sure he's the one who gave the command to yeah. just go in there and drop that yeah. bomb. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, well, but yeah, I, uh, he didn't mention he had one rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. There was no rule mentioning it, and there's no, uh... They do show his parents getting shot, but it's it's in flashbacks. So, like, right. I want to give the movie props for that. They didn't make us spend, like, you know, five to ten minutes watching an intro that we know, you know, we already know about. Right. Other movies after this are going to decide that we need to know about it harder. We need to know about it each and every time. Uh, really, this might be the first depiction uh, on screen. Not sure. Maybe. Yeah. And they definitely changed the origin a lot too, because oh, yeah. you know the, 100%. the certain individual I'm not who kills sure the parents. If I like that or not? Because yeah. well, okay, one hundred percent, it confused me because I watched the movies long before I, I touched any of the comic books. Uh, right. So it it definitely confused me until the Nolan uh, verse came out, mm. and then I and then I looked it up and I was like, oh, it's not who I thought it was forever. <laughs> right that was the same way same way with me is like i i thought it was a certain person because of this movie i thought it was a certain individual for so long then i started reading the comics and i was like what like yeah nobody else has it like this <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a bold choice there's a lot of bold choices made but i mean the the boldest choice is focusing so fucking long on uh alexander knox i hate that character like <laughs> he's a little obnoxious, sorry robert but i don't dislike him he's obnoxious he's a uh like very uh misogynistic like yeah that's true. He makes a, he makes a lot of gross jokes at the beginning that it's like i get it, it's the 80s but i was just like the whole time i'm like all right let's get away from this character and focus on bruce please like yeah fuck this guy and bruce doesn't make those jokes he does no he's the dumb. only thing he does is he sleeps upside down yes he does <laughs> like a bat <laughs> So, <laughs> I, I love that. That's another comedic moment. I'm sorry. I'll wrap up right after this. But that's another comedic moment that was so fucking funny is when Vicky Knox or Vicky Vale wakes up and she like looks over and he's just swinging upside down <laughs> while asleep. I love that shit. That was just so good. Okay. Well, I do think that's been our show. So we'll see you on Thursday, everyone. I've been the faceless Leon. And I've been the green traveler from Gorsh. Safe travels and good night. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash green and faceless. Toodles. Green and Faceless on the Couch is a proud production of Fiction Works 19. Are you a fan of the show? Feel free to contact us at greenandfacelessfans at gmail.com or visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash green and faceless. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Or Rate us on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening.